It's episode 120 of the Author Stories podcast, and this is the first ever Author Stories Story Workshop. This is the new Friday show that I told you about. I am joined today by Artie Cabrera and Jessica West, and we reverse engineer stories. I hope you enjoy it. We're going to have these every Friday uh, with new authors, and uh, I hope that you will go to HankGarter.com, subscribe, and go through all of the archives of the show and uh, get ready for more new content. I've got some new sponsors this week I'd like to tell you about. Uh, The first one is Swan's Night Sun by John C. Wright. John C. Wright is one of the living grandmasters of science fiction and won the 2016 Dragon Award for Best Science Fiction Novel at Dragon Con. Uh, Some readers said this book was thoroughly entertaining, a YA novel for all ages who enjoy imaginative urban fantasy. It's Swan Night Sun by John C. Wright. Also, The Unexpected Enlightenment of Rachel Griffin by Jaji Lamplighter. This book's about a magical girl detective. It's YA at its absolute best. One reader said it's like Fringe meets Narnia at Hogwarts, like Harry Potter, but better. So go check these out. There's links to these books in the show notes. Also, I'd like to thank Ellen Campbell for sponsoring the show. Ellen is an editor extraordinaire. If you are a writer and are looking for someone to help you make your writing the best it can be, go visit ellencampbell.thirdscribe.com. There you can find all of the clients that Ellen has worked with, and I guarantee you will find many books that you recognize that Ellen has had a hand in uh, behind the scenes. So if you need help, uh, with your manuscript, contact Ellen Campbell at ellencampbell.thirdscribe.com. Also, I'd like to thank Tom Freer for sponsoring the show this week. He's got a couple of books I'd like to point you toward. The first one is called Tom. It's a lighthearted and gently satirical fantasy that tells the story of a cat that has turned into a human. Uh, it's a fascinating story. I picked it up myself. I hope you will. And also, Changeling's Island by Dave Freer. Uh, this book was shortlisted for the Dragon Award. Uh, for best fantasy for the this book was shortlisted for the Dragon Award for best fantasy along with Larry Correa and Jim Butcher and for best YA book uh, Changeling's Island is a coming of age story full of magic mystery and creatures of all sorts I hope you'll go pick up a copy of it I did of each one of these and please let uh, let our sponsors know that you appreciate what they do and uh, allow us to keep bringing you great content each week so please pick up a copy of these fantastic books and let them know that you appreciate it and if you go to hankgarner.com you can find all of the archives of the show you can subscribe on itunes on google play at stitcher radio on youtube anywhere that you listen to podcasts you can find the author stories podcast thank you from the bottom of my heart for each of you tuning in and listening each week i've got lots and lots of new content coming to you more interviews with the authors that you want to hear so uh welcome everyone to the first ever episode of the author stories workshop uh as many of you know i I posted on facebook that uh, I was going to start a new fork of the Author Stories podcast, and what we're going to do here is uh, this episode is going to come out on Fridays, and I'm going to invite a couple of writer friends of mine to come on, and we're going to sort of reverse engineer some of our stories and talk about the creative process in a very real and tangible way. So. If you ever wanted to know kind of how the sausage is made, this is uh, a great podcast for you to see that. Um, some people don't want to know how the sausage is made, and that's great. That's what the Tuesday normal episode of Author Stories is for. But if you want to get down to the nitty-gritty of how uh, StoryCraft works, this is the show for you. So uh, I asked uh, to be my guest on the very first episode, Jessica West. Uh, writer and editor, and Artie Cabrera. Uh, both of these fine, fine writers are joining me in the, uh, or we all three are co-writing along with Daniel uh, Arthur Smith in the newest edition of Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. So I thought it would be fun to have uh, the three of us on the show, uh, and not Daniel, uh, to talk about uh, just kind of how we go about doing things. So uh, welcome to the show, Jessica and Artie. Thanks, 
So first off, uh, just really quickly, uh, Jessica, tell us a little bit about you and how you uh, came to be a writer. Well, it started a few years ago when I was uh, right after I had my third child. Uh, I had a lot more time on my hands than I thought I would. Uh, I was used to working a full-time job. I had for 11 years previously, even with my two oldest children, I still kept my job. Um, and then I, I took this writing workshop just as a hobby, just to fill my time. And it just kind of went from there. Okay. Three children. Good grief. How many children do you have? <laughs> yes, a lot of children. <laughs> That's a my, lot. Three is a well, lot. We, we have five, so that's uh, <laughs> that is a lot. That, that's more than a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about you, Artie? I have no kids. I have zero kids, but I do have five cats. So is that like kind of does that? Uh... Yeah, that totally counts. You have fur babies. Oh, okay. right, uh, right. They just have. They're just more obnoxious. Yes, than they're forever humans. three. So congratulations. You're going to be in the terrible threes for the rest of your life. <laughs> nice. Nice. Hurting a batch of toddlers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Obnoxious toddlers that don't actually care about you. Yeah. No. Yeah. no. Anyway. Uh, so how did you uh, first, uh, you know, get into writing, Gardy? Uh Okay. So let's go back to 2010. I had just uh, come out of the music business um, and going through a personal crisis, uh, but we're not going to discuss that. So, <laughs> okay, so I had a, I had an idea for a story, and um, all I wanted to do, and I've covered this so many times, but basically I just needed to get this little short story out, and I, the idea was just to do about 10 pages on a blog and put it out. And that was I'm Not Dead, the uh, journals of Charles Dudley. And the intent of that was just to have this creative purge that I had in me and just to get it out. But it, it took off, and it was two years later I completed the book and published it onto Amazon. And here we are. Awesome. Uh, what did you do in the music business? Uh, I was in a rock band. From the time I was 15, yeah. Uh, so I picked up about four instruments. I played drums, bass, guitar, um, was the predominant songwriter of our group. Then I got into the nightclub industry around the time I was 20, and I started DJing. And I pretty much played every nightclub in New York. That was, that was really neat. And then I just retired, had a minute a few years ago. Sweet. So, um, so did did storytelling come to you? Uh, you, you know, a, a lot of creative people are creative in in multiple facets. Uh, we we look for different outlets, uh, and one thing is kind of an extension of the others. Uh, right. Do you do you see any crossover between being a musician, songwriter, uh, and a story writer? Yeah, art for me is like oxygen. I need it. Um, I can't live without being creative in some form or another. So starting to write a story was – I kind of had a good, I guess, idea of where I wanted to go because I was a lyricist for about 20 years. Um, so I started from there, and uh, you know, I just – I mean musically – my idea was I will always say this, like my first book was kind of like, because I could never get like my record a record or record an album. This was my substitute. Like that was my, um, consultation, consultation package prize or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah. Con is it consultation? Yeah. Is it consolation? See, I'm a writer. Consolation. Actually, no, like, <laughs> consolation. Insulation. Consolation. Yeah. yeah. It's not insulation. You sure? Are you sure? You know, I'm not sure of anything. Okay. All right. Um, I just woke up. So, uh, that's actually not true. Uh, but I'm, I think already just woke up so that it's true for one of us. Uh, what about you, Jessica? Do you, do you have any, uh, any overlap with, uh, with different, uh, artistic expressions besides storytelling? Really? I'm just happy as long as I'm creating something and it's, it's 
that's manifests itself in, in various ways. I also like to create house plans, floor plans, kind of nice. weird, just way out there. It's just totally random. I, I have no um, architectural experience or anything like that. I just, I like to create floor plans. I love to, I can actually spend hours online looking at floor plans. It's, and you know, it's, it's all about creating for me. That's, that's, that's the draw for anything. It, basically any of my hobbies is just either creating something completely new or building on something else that, that already exists or, you know, just enjoying something that someone else created. Yeah, but uh, but that's a very visual uh, expression. And taking uh, when you're designing floor plans, you're 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 taking a space that is nothing and giving it order and uh, and and sort of a, a flow, uh, which is very much like storytelling. Yes, yes, absolutely. I've I've told the story of exactly how my my little coffee shop slash office slash bookstore is going to look in six years. And, and that's, that's my goal that I'm aiming for eventually. And, you know, I, I tell myself stories about it all the time and, and using the floor plans is, is sort of a tool in that storytelling process. It's, it's, I'm not telling a story. I'm not writing a story per se, but it's, it's something that takes place in my head from time to time. Once every few months, I'll revisit that, that little dream, that, uh, that goal and I'll make a floor plan, and I'll I'll decide what's going to go in it. You know where the bathroom's going to be, where the reception desk is going to be, and the cash register, and and just things like that. And I I'm, I plan my whole day. You know I plan launching my business and everything. So in a way, it's in in a, a very real sense for me, it's it's like telling a story. I'm just telling myself the story is all. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So we've established our creative cred. Um, Let's let's dig into um, because this podcast is very much <clears throat> some of the nuts and bolts of our creative process. No two writers or creators have the exact same process. I've done uh, 116 episodes of author stories, and no two people's stories are the same. Uh, so we all go about it differently, but uh, we want to kind of peel the layers back just a little bit and. And kind of show, uh, one, that this can be done. If, if you think you have a story in you, uh, it absolutely can be done. Uh, we've all done it. We've all had, uh, the three of us have, have had multiple things published. Uh, we've all taken, uh, a, a thing from idea and concept to fruition. Um, so I'll just kind of kick off the conversation, uh, to begin with. I, I want to talk about my story writer's block, uh, it, because it's my, uh, the latest thing I've published, uh, and probably one of the most personal things that I've ever published. Um, and, uh, I want to kind of just kind of peel back that just a little bit and just, and, and tell about it. Um, I came up with the idea for that story. I don't know, uh, the, the, the kernel of the idea, maybe two years ago, uh, I keep a file on my computer with story ideas. It's kind of a tickler file. Uh, as I get in, I, I would just get random, uh, little snippets of an idea. Sometimes, uh, it's a visual. Sometimes it's a, a sentence. Uh, sometimes something just sounds interesting to me. So I'll write it down. Uh, and then occasionally I'll go through that file and, and just kind of look to see if there's any ideas that, that spark something in me. Uh, and I was looking through that, that file one day, uh, about this time last year and saw, uh, I, I had written writer's block and I had written, uh, what if you had a magic typewriter that whatever you typed came true? And, and for some reason that just, uh, I, I have no idea where that, that kernel of an idea came from. Uh, but something about it, uh, fascinated me in some way. And when I read that, I, I saw a scene in my mind, uh, of a man sitting at a, at a computer, uh, not a typewriter, but he was sitting at a computer and he was not typing, but his hands were on the keyboard and he was looking, uh, just past his monitor, uh, over to the left of his monitor and there was an open window and there's an empty swing set and he was not typing, but he was staring at this empty swing set. And, uh, over on the other side of the office was this, this old typewriter that was sitting there and the story just unfolded to me from there. I, I 
I knew that that man was Stu Remington and that he was a successful published author uh, that had uh, finished two books of a trilogy and he was stuck uh, on the third and couldn't finish it. And that there were demons uh, hanging around uh, preventing him from finishing the story. Not demons in a metaphysical sense, but things haunting him, uh, things from his past, things that he uh, couldn't deal with. And so I started following Stu, and uh, I, I came to find out that he uh, that he had a daughter and a wife that uh, were both dead, and that he uh, was grieving uh, very heavily uh, over this. And uh, and then it, this typewriter that he found uh, that, that was in his office was one he found in a uh, in a, a yard sale, a garage sale. And he picked it up, and so to uh, to kind of jar the writer's block loose, he decided to get the old typewriter, put a sheet of paper in it, and just start typing. Uh, because I think we've all, you know, heard that one of the cures for writer's block is to write something completely different, uh, change your uh, your setting, and and all of that, and just see if it if the the change of pace. Uh, frees you from whatever it is that's that's holding you down. So he just types the first thing that comes to his mind. It's a complete nonsense story about a bear that wanders into a bar and uh, and uh, tries to dance with one of the women. And a, a redneck comes into the bar, kills the bear, uh, and uh, every everybody lives happily ever after. And so it was it was kind of funny to him. He laughed about it. Uh, still didn't fix his writer's block, but it it. You know, was was humorous to him. Uh, so the next day, he's in his office. He, he picks up the newspaper from outside, takes it up to his writing office, sits down, opens up the paper, and there's a front page story about a bear that wandered into this roadhouse on the outside of Weston, Mississippi, and uh, and all of the things ensued that he had written about in this uh, uh, on this typewriter. So he freaks out, uh, realizes that uh, you know that, that that something is up there. Um, and, uh, he, he has a, a dog, uh, a little, uh, English bulldog, uh, that's an obnoxious little stuck up dog, but he's, he provides, uh, kind of a, a little, uh, comic lift to the story. And, uh, Stu takes, uh, the dog whose name is Rolo, uh, out for a walk and they encounter a woman and a girl and the girl has cancer. Uh, he comes to befriend them and through, uh, getting to to know them and to kind of get outside of his depression and his self-imposed exile uh, and to start kind of caring for someone else, he starts to break through the ice of the writer's block. Um, so the end of that story, and it was just a, a short story to begin with, um, he uses his typewriter in, in ways that I, I won't completely give away, um, but he he does not heal the girl of cancer. Uh, the typewriter won't do that. Uh, there, there are rules to it that he doesn't quite understand. Uh, but he's able to use the typewriter to do some other things and kind of get outside of himself. And he, he starts to break through his writer's block. Um, I published that story, uh, about a year ago and, uh, Everybody seemed to love it. People started asking me what happens next to Stu. Um, does he finish the book? Does you know? Does this happen? Does that happen? And I, I, I have no idea. It was just a short story. I, I, I left the open. I mean, I left the ending ambiguous uh, because I love ambiguous endings. I don't know if the two of you uh, <laughs> love it, but I, I love not having complete resolution at the end of the story uh, because when when I finish reading a book. Uh, I want to feel like there's more for the character, uh, even if it's just left to me uh, to kind of let them work things out in my head. Uh, I, I don't need every little end tied up. You leave it um, open to interpretation for the reader. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and not to the point where you're just, you know, a dick about it and just don't give <laughs> the reader any resolution. Yeah. Um, you know, give them resolution, but but leave room uh, for for things to happen in the reader's mind, um, so I just I left it that way on purpose, and, and people started asking, and I said, "Well, I I wonder what Stu's ultimate end is," and and I started kind of thinking, "Okay, where does Stu go from here?" Um, 
how do these other people that have come into his life, uh, how do they fit in from here? Um, do, do these people become his family? I, I don't really think they do. Uh, not in the way that we might expect them to. Uh, and then Stu starts meeting some other people. He meets, uh, this old hobo who claims to be an angel. Uh, Yet he cusses like a sailor and he chews tobacco and all this kind of stuff. And, and he, uh, things that we would not associate with a, uh, white robe, you know, big feathered wings angel, uh, yet weird things happen, uh, with him and around him and stuff like that. So this whole kind of cast of characters unfolded around Stu and his situation. And, um, and I took it four more chapters into what I think uh, was the perfect ending for Stu. Um, so that's a little bit about where writer's block came from. Um, Jessica, what, what about you? What's one of the, a story that, uh, that you would like to well, kind of tell us how it got started or, or well, do you have any comment about anything else? Actually, I do this, this, this podcast, okay. we're doing like writer's workshop, right? So we're, we're talking about yeah. just our, each other, well, our own stories, but I, I sure. raised a few good points and I'm, I'm making notes here as you're, you're speaking. Um, so I just want to go over those for a minute, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, you mentioned the tactile experience of using a typewriter to sort of jog loose his writer's block. Um, yeah. and, and that's something that's, you know, on the surface, you, you know, you look at this book cover and you, you see the title and you say it's writer's block. Okay. Well, I know what this book is about. I already know what this book is about. So you use that, and it's it's a very real draw, I would think, for for authors because it's it's something expected. It's uh, you know when when you're when you're blocked and you can't write, you'll try just about anything to get past that. And the tactile right. experience of a, of using a typewriter is is unlike anything else. There's nothing. There's you can't get that any other way. Um, and it's also, not just any typewriter. It's not just any typewriter. It's a first generation IBM Selectric. And, and, uh, so if if you're our age or, <laughs> or or so, I remember sitting in typing class uh, in high school and putting my fingers on the home row keys. And when you switch on that typewriter, it vibrates into your hand. It's a that's a very real pronounced feeling. That there's nothing like it in the world, and it brings back. Uh, it, it, it's a very tactile feeling. It is. And then for the reader, you know, you, you've inserted this into your story and you've used it and it's, it's natural. It was completely natural to Stu. He's looking around and he sees this typewriter and he says, well, this is what I'm going to do. And, and as it pertains to writers and our styles and our stories and how we develop from, I have an idea for a story. I need to get this story down to this is who I am. This is what I write. This is a part of you. And that is so rewarding on the reader's end of it as well because a, a, a typewriter is something that's, okay, maybe it's becoming less and less common and that's completely tragic, but it's something that so many people, as soon as they saw that typewriter with Stu, they were like, wow, that's pretty cool. And as soon as he started typing on those keys, they could almost hear it. And, and you know, at that point in your story, the reader's drawn a little bit closer to the experience right alongside the character. And that's, that's what you, as an author, that's, that's the best thing you can do for your readers. You know, so that's, um, it, it's just funny. It's kind of, you know, you, you use these things and you, you see these things in stories and, and, you know, being an editor, I, I kind of shifted away from writing for a little while. Um, so I focus much more on, on deconstructing stories. I might be not, might not be using the right word with deconstructing, but, you know, I, I see things like this, and, and being a reader myself as well, I, I can see how, as a, as a part of your style, all these little personal experiences that you've had, they're seeping through and into your stories, and they're very rewarding. It's a small thing. You, you took this typewriter and, you, and, and this question, this what-if question, and you built a whole story around that, and it, it may have seemed so small and simple and... Like hardly nothing to you, just an idea. But it, it to me, you know, just from the other side of the the book, the screen, it's it's something completely different. It's an experience, and it's uh, you know, it's worth noting when, uh, especially when we're talking about this is a writing workshop. This is the kind of thing I would think, you know, that me as a writer, this is the kind of notes I'm taking, and, and as I'm learning from you, because that's something that. 
I want to be consciously aware of. Am I doing that in my own writing? I'd like to look for that in my own writing. What kind of experiences have I had that will resonate with with readers, could potentially resonate with readers? You know, how can I do this too? How can I emulate this? To me, this is a skill. So, you know, I just wanted to touch on that. Um, you know, using something familiar like that, you know, really just to bring some attention to that because I think it's it's a really important part of our craft that we understand is that our experience is what's resonating. It's what's making it past the words, past the story, past the thought. It's the experience. That's what's that's the connection. That's the conduit from the author to the reader. So I just wanted to take a minute or several minutes, I guess, I've been speaking for a while now, to touch on that. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks. Okay. I'm, I'm glad that that uh, um, that 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 resonated with you. That's uh, that I, as writers, I think you know that the saying is you only write what you know, and I think people interpret that as well. I can only talk about things that I've. Uh, that I've actually experienced or, you know, I can't write, uh, about a carpenter because I've never built a house. Uh, you know, but we all have experiences around that. And, and, uh, so I, I think the, exactly. the key is to, is to not get in the weeds with it, uh, but to, to, to share what our experience with it is, if that makes exactly. sense at all. It, it does. It yeah. makes perfect sense because you're writing through your own filter of experiences and preferences and beliefs and you, you can't get away from that. You can write about what you don't know about. You can learn. You can become an almost expert on anything. And you know, if you try really hard, you have enough time on your hands. But, um, yeah, that's, that's, Oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, writing what you know, what you're saying, writing what you know. I don't think it's, yeah. it's about knowing what a carpenter does and being able to write a convincing carpenter. I think it's right. more about understanding and being consciously aware of your experience with carpenters and carpentry and what you can learn about carpentry. You know, and, and just translating that to the page. I think that's it's that's more important than say writing something that you know a lot about yeah yeah um do, do you have a story that you would like to talk about um i don't know you know i really just i think i'd like to pull back and look at the bigger picture if that's okay, okay. yeah uh, yeah and, and just kind of talk about how i've I'll talk about a story since, you know, that, okay. that was what you asked me to do. Uh, one of the very first stories I wrote was actually just this little 500-word flash fiction piece uh, for the, the writing course that I took when I first got started writing. Um, it was weird. It was very strange. I had no clue I was capable of creeping myself out like that. But uh, it, it was this story about okay, the narrator was a plastic bag. Just a Walmart bag, you know, just a little plastic bag. This is the narrator. And this plastic bag, he had so much personality. And looking back on it, I'm still, I, 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 maybe it's conceited to admit it, but I'm impressed with myself because this plastic bag had, bag had such a personality. He was just really cocky and, and he had this superiority. How do you, the superior, I don't know vision of himself, uh, you know, this big ego. Uh, and, and he's telling the story of this, this girl who lives in an apartment with her boyfriend or fiance, whatever, and he's at work and she's a bit of a prankster and she decides she's, she's going to play a joke on him. It's going to be hilarious. Um, so she takes this plastic bag and she pulls it over her head and she tapes it around her neck and she's going to lay on the floor. Her plan is to lay out on the floor and pretend to be dead to, you know, pretend to have committed suicide. Basically, I have a really messed up sense of humor. I learned that about <laughs> myself. Like I said, I really creep myself out with that one. But anyway, so, yeah, that that was her idea of a prank. And, you know, of course, she tapes this plastic bag around her head and she does a very good job and she can't breathe and she's using duct tape so she can't get the plastic bag off. So oh she God. ends up effectively committing suicide, basically. And the, the, the whole point of the story was just this plastic bag just 
shaking his head mentally, you know, going, this stupid, stupid girl. What was, <laughs> what did she expect? You know, that was the whole point of the story. And, you know, this is oh. one of the very first things I wrote. So I keep going back to it and, and thinking about it like, just that's kind of messed up. <laughs> that That is messed up, but in a, in a, it in is. a great way. It, um, it is. But I just, I have this really morbid sense of humor and I needed to learn that about myself. And I tend so, to like characters who, who pull back and just look at other characters and just shake their heads like, you idiot. Yeah. <laughs> so, so immediate, uh, immediately this comes to mind. Um, did you, uh, did you know the resolution of that story when you began it? No, it was a free writing exercise. That was the assignment. Okay. My assignment was to free write for however many minutes. I think it was like five, ten minutes, whatever, um, and just see what we came up with. And in a few minutes, free writing, that's what I came up with, the plastic bag. That's genius. I love that. <laughs> um, you know, and one of our jobs as writers is to take the mundane – and find ways to look at it differently. Uh, and for you to tell a story, uh, and when granted, uh, the, su- <laughs> the suicide of a, of a young woman is not necessarily mundane. Um, but you know, it, it's, uh, it's something that we, we all have seen uh, a story or uh, a movie or have heard some report of a suicide and, and we have preconceived notions about that, but to tell that story from the perspective of the paper of the plastic bag <laughs> is genius. That is, that that's what we are supposed to do as writers, find a different way to tell the story. And you know, it, it's personification. That's something I also have yes. to learn about myself. I tend to, I tend to do that a lot, almost to the point where it's my own personal cliche, but it's just something that it's a part of my voice. It's a part of my style. Personification, if you look really hard, sometimes it's subtle, but it's in almost everything I do. I will give a personality to almost anything. And, and you know, it was there from the very beginning, and it, it still amazes me. You know, I'm, I'm writing these things, and, and my work has evolved in a way. I'm, writing, I'm currently writing this story where I have personified energy. Uh, I think it was Einstein who said, Energy never really goes away. Who was it that said that? I don't know who said that. But energy never really goes away. It's just transferred from one place to another. And it just got me – it opened a whole different train of thought for me, and I'm pulling in. That's what of Newton's laws of thermodynamics, isn't it? Okay, that's what it is. See, I don't – science, I can't handle it. (laughs) (laughs) That is is not my forte. That's not my strong point. But, yeah, that's – so that's where that came from. That's good to know. Now I can do some it's, more uh, research. Yeah. But yeah, that's, and, and it's, it's basically what I'm doing at, at you know, you, you, if you're, if I pull away from the story and the plot and everything and strip it down bare, that's basically what I'm doing is I am personifying energy and I'm applying that as to our souls. Uh, and, and that's the, my very first novel is, I don't want to give too much away because I'm currently writing the thing. I'm writing the second draft. I've just finished the first draft, and now I'm tons of work ahead of me, so I'm rewriting everything. But that's that's what I'm basically doing. I'm personifying energy, and that's only one aspect of it. But it's you know that's that's why I wanted to maybe talk about writing in maybe a broader sense than rather than focusing on one story because yeah. to me that's that's also another thing that I like to be consciously aware of is. Who am I as a writer? What, what are my goals? What's, what, how does my experience influence my stories? I need to know that. I need to be able to identify that so that I know how they could potentially resonate with readers so that I can make sure or try my best to make sure that they do resonate with readers. And I'm just making a note to myself uh, to explore personification more. I, I love that. Um <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it, it opens up a whole new cast of characters for it you does. and a new viewpoint mm-hmm. uh, to to report on what your characters are doing. Um, so if I could tell the story from the perspective of the plastic bag or if I could tell the story of a robbery from the oak tree uh, on the property, you know, that's a right. that's a. Uh, oh, my God. That's a wonderful. Uh, 
the tree that's a wonderful who owns tool to itself. use. <laughs> yes, it is. It's a wonderful tool. The tree who yeah. owns itself. You just you're, you're making these, these stories and you're just throwing out an example. But there's a tree who owns itself. That's a story right there. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. There's a oh, story man. right there. And yeah. there's you a, a great practice in personification. If you want to uh, to implement implement that into your writing and maybe practice that, that's your assignment. Write that tree's story. I want to hear it from his, uh, I don't know, branches. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With the mouth of a tree. <laughs> well, the next story of mine that you edit, uh, look for it in there. So um, let's bring Artie into the conversation real quick, and we're going to loop back around uh, in just a little bit. But Artie, uh, tell us uh, about one of your stories and, and where the idea came from. Oh, it's my turn. Sorry, I was listening to you guys and. <laughs> yeah, did you? Did we wake you? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, one of the things uh, it sounds like you you guys put a lot of thought into your stories. Um, well, not necessarily. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, my method is that I don't have a method. Okay. Yeah. You know, so, but I want to talk about like you. You brought something up earlier where um, you're talking about having like a neat ending, uh, yeah. or uh, not having one, or the lack thereof, and not having uh-huh. and having a story that doesn't end cleanly. And a lot of a lot of readers will disagree with you because that pisses people off. You know, I know. I know. And, you know, you're talking about someone who just read 250 pages, 300 pages, or whatever the case may be, and he gets to the end, and it's and it just stops. Which I think is a beautiful thing because that's how Dudley ends. There's no the it just ends. But I got some criticism about that. And, well, I, uh, and I'm and I'm not saying that it did you just stop the story in the middle, uh, but you just leave some story. Uh, some some story threads untied. Uh, I'll just put it that way. Well, no, I just stopped the story in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. now, see, I mean, there's also that option. That that so, will make people angry. <laughs> but it, it does. And so, well, what I mean by that is like what I what I really want to. Well, it, it happened by accident because what happened was I got to a certain part and the tone of the story was going to going to completely change and would have required a whole other book. Uh, so I stopped at the perfect time where I thought, okay, there's going to be a turn here and I can't go any further. So I look at it as my back to the future ending when Doc Brown comes back at the end and he's yeah. like, we got to go. And that's, that's my ending. And it pissed people off. Cause it's like, Oh, screw you. Like I invested all the time in reading the story. I get here and there's nothing. But I, I find that beautiful because, look, um, I'm not one to follow format. I like things that are messy. I like things that are raw. Um, a perfect example of that is if you ever seen Pulp Fiction. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Halfway through the movie, it turns on its head. And you're like, wait, how is John Travolta here? He just died two minutes ago. And so, But they take liberties with formatting. And I think that's great because you have to do that sometimes. You have to play with things. You have to kick the formula in the balls and, you know, look at it from different angles. So, you know, I think it's all a matter of preference. As far as leaving an open end goes, it's a matter of personal preference, and you cannot please everybody. It's not going to happen. The best you can do is look for your readers and hope you find them and hope they find you. Uh, Yeah, so I I don't, I don't know. Some people people off. It's going. Yeah, some people appreciate the ballsiness of or or okay, like you know, Sopranos. At the end of Sopranos, they just cut out. I don't know if you guys have seen The Sopranos. Do you guys have you guys ever seen The Sopranos? Years um, ago, I watched it. Only in the choir. Okay. They're, anyway, they're so the we, ladies over on the right side, right? Right. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. So at the end of The Sopranos, <laughs> season finale, they do something so crazy, and millions of people freaked out and and lost it because like, how dare you end the show that way? I laughed my ass off. Because I'm like, bravo, good for you to take that that huge of a risk. But it was beautiful yeah. because it opened up – I mean people are still talking about it. People, people are still interpreting what happened and creates this conversation. And I think it's a beautiful – I think it's genius. 
but pe- some people will not appreciate the genius and will just, you know, freak out and, and hate the creators for, for doing that. Some, some people want their stuff tied up in a pretty bow. I don't yeah, do that. I, I, well, I'm, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't necessarily need it tied up. Uh, I, I think, uh, I, I understand what, what both of y'all are saying that, you know, that will definitely piss off some readers. Um, but I think just as many readers will, will kind of shake their head and go, yeah, you know, maybe that's the only way that would work. Um, right. Uh, but the story you're talking about is I'm not dead. The journals of Charles Dudley, right? Right. Yeah. Where did, where did that story come from? Um, I'm stalling because I don't think about it a lot. It was just, it came from, I'd when, say, when did you first start writing it? Um, 2010. Okay. Uh, 2010, I just started, uh, jotting down notes and, and, uh, cause what I really wanted to do was at the time I was watching a lot of horror movies and, okay. um, zombie stuff. And what I really wanted to do was I want to create a world where I can bring all my toys into it. Like I want to bring every move that I've ever seen, every comic book that I've ever read, every song I've ever heard, every person I've ever met in my life, every crisis I've ever been through and just throw it into the story. And just like I said, purge it's, it's 30 years of purging emotions and, uh, just ugliness because I'm generally a quiet person, right? <laughs> so I pretty much stick to myself. And, and this is more of me like saying, this is who I am. And a lot of people who read it at first um, were so shocked because the story is a little loud and violent and um, loony. So it's like, oh my God, I've never realized you had this shit going on in your head. And so I like that. I like that element of surprise. It's like, oh my God, you're talking about child molestation and rape and, and violence. It's like, yeah, well, you know, look, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, you tell the story. You tell the story. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to go all out with the story. And, um, uh, it was really for me, really for anyone else, because I had no idea what KDP was or, I didn't know anyone who read a book, but it was something that I needed to, to get out. Really, no, I mean, because I was just, like I said, I was in the music business for 20 years. So I was just doing music, and really, this was just like a little project for myself, my li- own little um, therapy session, pretty much. It was very, uh, like I said, purging is the word I can I can come up with, because that's always me vomiting my soul into the story. And with no, no, um, you know, illusions of like ever getting published by a major company or like Harper Collins or Penguin or whatever like that. This was something I just wanted to keep to myself and show a couple of my friends and move on. But the story took on a life of its own and it went from 10 pages to 50 pages to 100 pages and it just kept going and going and morphing into all these different things, directions and only, uh, I'd say 2011, 2012 was when KDP, KDP was really coming into the picture. Mm-hmm. And it seemed uh, possible to publish. And I put it out, again, not thinking anything of it, not thinking that this was going to be cover. I really thought people have not, never written, written a book before. Um, but the attitude was, okay, well, you have the Philharmonic Orchestra. Right, which you know, and then you have uh, rock bands that are like Nirvana, not great musicians, but they have an energy about them, uh, character to them. And I figure, well, if, I'm never going to be that writer, but I want to go in, uh, like, with a harsh energy, just like, like a little ball of power. And if it goes out and it fizzles, fizzles out, at least I know that I accomplished something. That I did that. You know, like I never thought I was going to go and write five books or 10 books or 15 books or whatever. I just needed to get this piece out and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, and by the, the way, if I ever get, if I ever get away from the question, yeah. pull me back in thoughts usually just run oh, no, off. No, 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 no. Okay. I, I, I love what you did there. Um, oh, I'm, I'm just processing through a couple of questions I want to ask you. Um, you, you talked about there was some very hard 
subject matter uh, yeah. in this book and that people's reaction to that was, oh, my God, Artie, I didn't know that was in you. Um, obviously, you're not condoning uh, the the harsh, horrible things that happen in the book. No, because those things happen in life. Exactly. And and that's my point is that how this, – this is my question to you, and, and Jessica, I'd like to hear your uh, input also because I know you have a, a sick, twisted little mind also. Um, but how do you – Handle as a writer and as being a reporter on the realities of life. Uh, how do you handle tackling these these horrible subjects uh, without uh, and and handling them? Let, let me see if I can get this question out uh, the way I want it to come out. Um, how do you report on it realistically uh, and convey the horrors of it? Without becoming the thing, you can't style. Are you want me to go well, first? <laughs> yeah, no, I'll cover it since my thought. I'm there, so like, because okay. I'll lose it. Yeah, um, you, you can't shy away from it, right? You know, I, I think when we read the news and hear about all these horrific things that happen on in a basis, you know, we get to see it from afar, and then we get to move on, right? Right. It's like I hear about an incident that happened or, uh, or an accident or whatever. You hear about it and then you're, you're on, you're, you're moving on and you don't have to re- revisit it and it's or whatever. But so what I did was I, you know, with a couple of issues that I discussed in the book is, you know, you have a couple, um, you have, there's a scene where someone's getting raped. Uh, I cover child molestation, but I don't do it where it's like I'm exploiting it. You know, where it's like, look at this. It's, you know, no, it's, this is the reality. And then a lot of people, um, appreciate the language. They don't want, you know, like someone read the book and said, oh, there's too many cursing, too many curse words in it. But if you look at real life, real life is harsh. You know, people are cursing, people are animals, people are committing crimes, people are doing a bunch of things. You can't shy away from it because it's there. You know, if you just go stand on any street corner, you know, life is happening and people are doing things that you're not necessarily going to um, agree with, but it's there. It exists. You can't pretend that it does not exist. And with my book, I want to face a lot of things, My own, even my own personal demons. I want to face head on um, and a lot of the anxieties and a lot of um, injustices that I felt like with people I know in my life, you know, I, I have friends that have been raped. I have friends that have been molested when they were children and they've gone on without having any justice, you know? So I kind of did things in the book to not that I could ever do anything to, to, to save whatever pain they're going through, but I wanted to put it on the paper and there's a lot, you know, my friend Charlotte who helped me tremendously editing the book, you know, when she, she was reading through it, she's like, this is so heavy. I had to put it down. Now I'm not saying that the way I articulated um, these things are, yeah. you know, whatever I, I did it in a way that, that is as heavy as life can get handed over to you. You know, yeah, you get right. pu- you get punched in the face sometimes, you know, and yeah. that's why I want to do with my story. I want I want you to read it and get punched in the face. You know, I might not I might not have written written it like uh, uh, what's the word eloquently, but you feel it. And that's what I dumped mostly in the book. It was like 150 percent emotion and myself as a story, you know, not worrying. Oh, should I use this word and I wasn't, uh, you know, scouring through the, the source to find a prettier word. It's like, this is, this is what you're getting. What you want, you re- when you read my book, you're getting all the emotions and all the purging and all the demons and so on and so forth. So everything in that book is real aside from obviously it has like a, um, a zombie element to it. Right. Or, uh, you know, end of the world element to it, but that's all a metaphor. That's how it started out. It's like you got this guy going through life and his life is constantly feeling like the end of the world. And there, there are people in his life who are monsters and uh, there are people in his life who are, you know, obviously his friends and good people. But so I took that and I twisted it and I turned it into this whole other big thing. Does that make sense? Are you, are you following? Oh, absolutely. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. So it was, um, it was really me. It was really me just, just, just dumping every fiber of anger and love because at the time while I was writing it, my, my girlfriend who, you know, she was my high school sweetheart and all that stuff. And, you know, someone I planned to, to, you know, spend the rest of my life with, she walked out the door and I found myself at home alone. Right. And it felt like, yeah, and I really don't want to bum anyone out, but we're talking about the process, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. it just felt like the walls were, were crumbling. And I, that's why I needed to write the story because I had no other outlet and I wasn't making music. So I wasn't going to sit down and write a song about it. So, and plus I've always wanted to write. I've always written. I've been writing since I was a kid in some form or another. And then that eventually, um, you know, that eventually went towards music. And then when music was over, I said, you know what? I, I've always wanted to do this. Let me sit, sit, sit down and do it just for myself. Um, but fortunately, you know, it, it went on to other things. And now I'm writing other stories, which is cool because I love writing. And I covered on Preston's podcast the other day is that if you're doing something, you have to love what you're doing. Right. Because it's not always a bowl of cherries, you know, like even if you have a day job, you know, some days are going to be horrible. Other days are going to be great. But at the end of the week, you get you come home with that paycheck and you get to do other things in your life. Now, I'm not going to go on a tangent, but um, at the core of it, anything that you do, you got to love what you do, because when those shittier times come, you're going to sit there and you're going to you're going to consider bailing or, you know, you're not going to want to do anymore. You're going to you're going to resent the craft. You know, and I know, that, you know, and I'm sure there are people that got that got into it because it, it looks cool, and that's the wrong reason why you should do it. It's got to be in your heart to do it, not just um, a monetary little gimmick that you think you can pull off. Well, yeah, thought, because for for every you know Friday that you're recording a podcast, there's a Tuesday morning where you're sitting at the keyboard and have nothing to write. Right. Or you're faced with a tough, tough subject, and you're thinking, "Okay, how am I going to approach this?" But yeah, I, I see what Artie's saying. You know, if you don't love what you're doing, you get to a, a tough subject. You know, for him, it was more a, a need to exercise emotional demons and, and get them out. And uh, and I definitely understand that. But yeah, that's if you don't love what you're doing, why would you bother putting yourself through that? Yeah, and, and like I said, and and you know, when I say these things, I really don't want to piss people off, but I, it, it pisses me off in a way that when I see someone doing something and I, I, it feels like they're not genuine about it. It, that bothers me because I have, I have passion that just, it's totally oozing out of me all hours of the day. You know, sometimes I don't know what to do with it. And sometimes there's so much of it that I can't bring myself to write a story or to, uh, to do a graphic or to do whatever creative because there's so much of it that it's like, I just kind of have to walk away for a little bit. And then when I get it under control, then I'll come back and work on it because there's so much of it that I want to, you know, it's like being a kid in the candy store. I know that sounds cliche, but it's like when you walk, you want, you want it all, right? You want everything. It's like, you can't, you can't consume it all because it's a moderation. And I don't, I don't even have the discipline to sit here in the mornings and force a story. And I, I, I think it's cool that there are writers out there that are so prolific that can, they can like just, you know, dump it out. And I can't, I can't force a story. I feel guilty sometimes because it's like, okay, story be written. And I can't do that. It's got to come to me organically. You know, and I'm not special. I'm not saying I'm special. You know, whatever my way is a better way than anyone else's. But that's just who I am. And we all have our different, you know, methods of of approaching things. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this: um, How did you decide on the vehicle of Charles Dudley for the story? Uh, like, you, was, like, like you had, you know, things that that you wanted to portray and things you wanted, but how did you decide to use Charles Dudley as the way to tell that story? Um, Charles Dudley is your guy next door. He's not, okay. he's not a superhero. He's not, you know, a great looking guy. He's your guy next door, and um, so I want to use someone that maybe other people can relate to. You know, um, right. Because these are these are real people problems. You know, it's not like 
oh, I found a crystal and it turned me into a superhero. And no, no, it's, I didn't want to go that route. I just want to use someone who is normal. And not only did they have to go through their own um, obstacles personally, but then they get this whole other thing dumped on them, which is the global crisis or the end of the world or the apocalypse or whatever. Um, so it's like, that was my way of saying like, you know, sometimes, you know, when it rains, it pours, it's like you got five problems to deal with, but then five new problems arise, you know, arise. And it's like, so that's, that's pretty much how, what I wanted to do. And that's how I felt at the time, because I was going through a horrible anxiety disorder. It just felt like one, it was just piling up and piling up and piling up. And so again, so one of my, um, the ways of dealing with that is, was to write it, was to just to get it out as opposed to just keeping it in. You know, so it's a whole other reason why I was doing it. Gotcha. Did um, did you envision the ending from the beginning? No, no. I just wanted to write it um, with no beginning or no end. This, the book itself starts in the middle. Okay. The arrangement's really crazy. Like the book itself starts in the middle, then it goes back to the um, – beginning and then flips back towards the end and the reason i did that is because i read something that stephen king said and because i was also conscious of um you know someone's gonna read this i gotta grab them by the throat real quick right you know um and (laughs) stephen king calls them hookers Right, and not you can't hookers. Say that on the sh- you can't say that on the show. <laughs> They're called hookers, and <laughs> so the, the idea is that you read that first line or you read that first paragraph, and you're sold. You're like, oh crap, I'm gonna okay. Now I'm reading this. Um, though the first line of my book is, I found Jerry dead on my lawn, and so I don't know, like that. That I think that set the the tone for what you're you were about to read. Um, yeah, because who's Jerry? Who found him? Right, and so anyway, so refresh my memory. What, what, what am I answering? Because I'm trying to behave and not busy with these answers. Oh, no, I was just saying. Did you know the ending from the beginning when you? All right. So the no, the ending. No, I had, there was nothing. I just wanted to write it, and also, um, you know, I didn't want to adhere to the rules because I hate rules. I don't like, especially when it comes to art, and um, you know, when you when you shackle yourself to these rules and these margins. You know, there isn't a lot of breathing room. You got to play within these walls, and i i want to I want to play outside the box. You know, that's where all the fun things are. Right. So um, I didn't sit there and say, oh, "Okay, this is the beginning, this is the end, this is the middle, and this is how the story's going to end." No, I just want to leave it open ended because, you know, I read. I re- I used to read a lot of like autobiographies, and those story like those books don't end unless the person is dead. Right, they reach a certain point in their life, and this, the book is over until they write another autobiography or whatever. So I didn't want to say, "Oh God, I gotta write a complete ending," because you know, if you write a, a, an ending that's just like seals the deal, then I can't go any further. So I just wanted to leave it open. So if I did want to write further, which I did, I just left it open. Um, and I, I, I mean, really, I didn't think people were gonna be like, "Oh man, there's no this ending sucks." <laughs> you know, I didn't know that. Right. I just put it out and let it be, you know, let it take its course. Cool. Um, Jessica, uh, I, I asked a minute ago about, uh, uh, and thank you for that, that answer already. Uh, but Jessica, I asked about tackling these uh, odd or hard subjects uh, and Telling them uh, realistically without uh, – but also telling them with compassion and with empathy. Uh, how do you go about that as a writer? Uh, well, the same and exactly the opposite is already actually. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly that you have to – when you approach any kind of subject, it's, if it's tough, you know, heartwarming, uh, romance, action, anything involving any kind of theme – you just you have to tell the story honestly, and to do that, you have to face it head on. You have to be aware of of, of what you're talking about, and, and you know you have to treat it with respect. And but where I, I differ from Artie is that I have to remove myself 
from the subject matter entirely emotionally. Um, and that's, I think that's why a lot of my narrators are omniscient or third person, you know, limited or personification, you know, personified objects or animals and such is because I, I need that filter between me personally and that subject matter. Um, That's and great. It's, it's, it's a weird thing. I, I do the same thing with grief. I'm very familiar with grief. So I do the same thing. I'm, that's how I get through sometimes. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you have to feel it. Sometimes you just have to feel it. But that's how I, I get through a lot of things, and especially tough subject matters. When they come up, you know, you, you, you take a step back and you remove yourself from the situation. You're not a part of this. You're telling a story. And for me, it was very much, it's, it's usually very much a matter of looking at a story and, and just transcribing it, basically. And then what I've always said it, it's, it's like for me is I'm like a, a doctor in, in a doctor's office. You have the waiting room and you have all these characters waiting there. They've signed in and they're ready to tell their story. They're just waiting for you to be ready to call them back. So you call them back to your office, and when you're ready to sit down with them, you transcribe the story. And I kind of see myself like that. I'm the, I'm the author. I'm the doctor. I'm, I'm sitting there and just basically listening to them, letting them tell their stories, um, and then I just transcribe them. So for me, it's it's very rarely, you know, you, you hear about these, some authors who are method authors, like method actors. They have to really get into the character's head to write, and I tend to take a different approach. I remove myself emotionally entirely and I'm, I'm more of a, an observer and just transcribing a story. So that's how I handle any, anything. Any, any, that's how I approach pretty much every writing project, including the tough subjects. That they're, it's, it's no different no matter what the subject matter is. It's never any different. It, I'm still just telling the story as honestly as I can. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, that's that's yeah. also a difference between, um, you know, and I guess, you know, some people do find it tough. Like, you know, see, I, I lived a hard life and that's not me like asking for sympathy or anything. But, yeah, I, I've seen things happen and, um, you know, I think it's easier for me to talk about it because I've experienced it. And some people who are outside the bubble are I don't want to say be turned off, but it's going to hit them harder because it's like, oh, my God. Um, so, you know, when, uh, when a friend of mine was sexually assaulted, you know, um, and she spoke about it, it, it was just a hundred times like it was like ma- like magnified. I'm like, oh, my God, because you hear p- women are getting raped a lot, you know, so and it's it sucks. You know, it sucks. But then when someone actually sits down and tells you, walks you through it. Um, because they need to talk about it, it's hard to listen to because it's like, yeah. oh my god, you never yeah. want to imagine that hell, and you, you know, it's so. Yeah, I, I'm different. I'm different. I know. I understand that it's, it's a sense. That these are sensitive issues, but I just just dive right in, you know, um, because. I'm weird like that. Not that I get off on it or not, like I said, not that I want to exploit it, but I don't know. Like I, the way I look at it is that, you know, I don't know. Um, and I feel, I feel, I feel bad sometimes cause I don't want people to walk away from reading something that I've read feeling horrible, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the fine line that we walk is how to, uh, write something that is realistic, uh, but, uh, provokes an emotion in the reader, uh, without them just falling into complete despair. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the job of the writer is to, uh, to sprinkle a little hope every now and then, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, so that, so that there's something, uh, redeeming about the story. Yeah, which I don't, I don't think there's really anything redeeming about my story. Well, according to one reviewer, <laughs> yeah. No, someone actually wrote in a review, no redeeming value, one star. <laughs> don't read. They probably just- missed the point then. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, you know, and, and we have that and that's, that's, uh, that's one of the knocks that we take as writers is that some people don't get it. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I think if you have a story that everyone, absolutely loves um 
you know, maybe people aren't being completely honest uh, because it, it, everybody doesn't like the same thing. And, and that's just, that's the reality of it, you know. Um, Artie and Jessica, we've been recording this for, uh, for right at an hour. Now we're going to, we're going to wrap it up here, but I want, uh, each of you to, uh, leave our listening audience, uh, with a, a, a practical tip, uh, that they could use, uh, if, uh, in their daily writing, maybe they're a new writer that's uh, lacking the confidence to get started, or maybe they're a seasoned writer who's looking to bring something new to their writing. But what what one piece of advice would you give another writer, Artie? And did we just lose Artie? I think we may have. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let me see if I can bring him back. I'll tell you what, Jessica, while I try to bring Artie back, will you uh, leave our audience with uh, with a piece of advice? Sure. Uh, if I could give any author advice, whether new or if you've been in this for years, it's to remember that nobody can stop you from doing this. Just, you know, you, you have to do this. You are the only person who can stop yourself from doing this. And I think it is really, really hard to remember that sometimes. Um, in, in your darkest moments or in my darkest moments as an author, there are times when I think that it is beyond my control. There are times when I have completely convinced myself that it's beyond my control, that I can't do this anymore and I'm going to have to stop right here. And it's what gets me through is reminding myself that I am the only person who can stop myself. I'm the only person who can keep myself from writing. That's uh, that's a great piece of advice. Uh, you are the storyteller. This is a very singular art form, uh, and you are you're the only one that can do it. Uh, Artie, are you back? Yeah, I, I don't know what happened. You started sounding like a robot, <laughs> and it just <laughs> cut out. Yeah, that's Skype. Sometimes it happens. Uh, <laughs> Jessica <laughs> just okay. So fill me Jessica in. What did just, I miss? No, what um, Jessica just gave a piece of advice to writers uh, to remember uh, that they are in control of their writing. They are the ones uh, that can do it. It can be done, uh, but you've just got to do it. What piece of advice would you give to another writer? Uh, you know, what, when I say these things, I always feel like I'm, I'm being like mean or whatever, um, <laughs> because I have a different mindset. And again, I'm not, I'm not special. I mean, I'm not putting myself on a pedestal or whatever, but, um, you know, you got to just write the story that you want to write and um, don't get too caught up with if it's going to be commercially viable or if everyone's going to love it because not everyone's going to love it. It's some people are going to have their own um, perspective of what your story is, you know. So, you know, as long as you, know, you want to write a story where, you know, you want to two years from now, you want to look back and 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 be proud of it, you know, and not – be like, oh, I did that because of, um, and I sound like a broken record, but you don't want to write something just because it's like trending and because that's the hottest topic at the, the time, which, you know, it's fun to do that because, you know, I, you know, I talk a lot, of, I talk a lot of shit because, you know, I say, I give science, hard science writers crap for, you know, writing their stories, but I love science and I love science fiction and I love all kinds of books. Um, but it's hard for me to, to monitor what's really the, the popular story because you can't, you don't know what's going to be popular six months from now. Right. So if spent, if I spent, um, all my time, a particular story, to kind of get into that bubble of what's what's trending and whatever, you, you're kind of screwing yourself because by the time your book comes out, people might not want to read it because it's already been done a million times because everyone else wrote the same same story. So it's just write your story, write whatever you want to write, and people will like it because there is an audience for everything, and so that's it. Excellent advice. Right. 
Yeah, excellent advice. I'm going to uh, give one piece of advice, and that is – uh, to start writing the story that's in your head and don't think, don't wait until it's fully formed to begin it. Maybe you have a scene in your head. Maybe you have a character, uh, like I did with Stu and I just sat down and I started writing Stu until Stu, uh, was fully fleshed out for me. And, and then the story kind of wrapped around him. Uh, begin with what you know and uh, and let the story grow from there. Uh, so that's what I would say. Uh, I'm going to leave our audience with a writing prompt uh, this week because this is a, a workshopping show. Um, so as a fun exercise, I would like to say uh, I'm going to borrow from Artie and from Jessica, and I'm going to say as a writing prompt this week, take a situation uh, that is uh, maybe a, a hard emotional situation uh, like Artie was talking about, but tell that story uh, from an inanimate object's perspective. Uh, so use that personification that Jessica talked about. Use uh, that, uh, that, that difficult subject matter that Artie talked about and craft a story around that. Uh, Artie and Jessica, thank you for taking time out of your day to come on the show. Oh, thanks thank for having you. us.